New advanced missiles, coupled with sophisticated radars, long-range optical IR sensors, all digital avionics, and network tactics have moved air combat from the close-in dogfight to an even more dynamic beyond visual range arena. In this final segment, we'll hear more from naval aviators and Northrop Grumman engineers who will give us a look at technologies just entering the fleet or in development. And during OIF, we were in the ATO, the air tasking order, at 1.3 thousand allied and coalition sorties a day over Iraq, so blue on blue is a real concern. As weapons change and become more sophisticated, uh, the fight has gotten further and further apart and we have the ability to knock down the enemy fighters miles away, but you still have the limitations of ROE and positive ID and I think there are still scenarios today, even with the most sophisticated systems, that the enemy system may cancel yours out and you may be forced to jump in the phone booth, as we call it, call it and do close in air combat maneuvering. At IRST is more of a, a situational awareness builder. It, it doesn't necessarily tell you what kind of aircraft it is, but it will tell you that something hot is out there. And it may provide a piece of information to the aircraft that you need. Again, there's, you know, where, where other aircraft are. Uh, if you had a TVSU, and, and in many cases nowadays, a FLIR can provide that same sort of information. Uh, if, if it's the magnification sufficient uh, on it, you could get a visual identification outside of where you could with just, with just your own eyes. So uh, you, you have a variety um, of systems going there to help augment the, uh, the radar. Very, very great system in the fact that it could detect very long ranges, the infrared signature or track of an airplane. So you couldn't ID anybody at that time, but what it did was help you slave, you know, you could see what a line of bearing or point two a threat way out there, double digit, triple digit miles, and then you can slave the radar over towards it and have the radar then look, so it helps you out. It has, it has a search function to it. It can search the sky, find something, lock onto it and track it, and then you can slave the radar over. And then at that point too, getting close in, you'd slave the TCS over, the uh, electrical opera system. So you had three systems working independently, which you could slave together to help you find and track a target. Where we oftentimes will do is realize that no one sensor technology can address every need that the warfighter has. We look for a combination of sensors which can additively uh, provide the services that the, that the pilot may need. The more we can put that information on a display in front of a pilot, the more we can get him oriented to the entire battle space, the better he odds he has of completing his mission and going home to dinner. So our challenge is to make all that occur. I think the greatest systems put on the fighter today was the Link 16 system. Uh, it's, we developed it for the F-14D, which is the first fighter, but it allowed information to flow into your cockpit from outside your cockpit that wasn't your sensors. So anybody could send you tracks. It was fighter to fighter day links. So you could get day link from your fellow fighters around you to know where they were because that's very important. You got to know where other your friendly fighters are, your, your wingmen and the other people in your division. Also the E2 could send you tracks and the E2 had obviously a great radar. So you got this porting of information in the cockpit which you've never had before and a tremendous advantage especially in an air to air fight against fighters without the data link. It was like an unfair fight. The TID itself, for a guy like me that came from the F-4, now you have this big nine-inch display where you can offset your own aircraft into the middle of it and blow it up to 200 mile scale, and you can see data link tracks all around you. You can locate your own home base. Um, you can be receiving E-2 data. Uh, for SA, for situational awareness, was, was a giant step forward. Once you got out, way out on cap station, uh, to have a net of four fighter aircraft. Uh, you could see your own partners 50 miles away on their cap station and uh, see their fuel state and their armament status and everything by yourself without requesting help from the E-2 or, sh or shipboard. So some of those sensors really are there to provide general flight awareness, help the pilot from a, from a safety standpoint, but they also provide the ability to detect threat events and not that they would provide full resolution and the ability to engage those threats, but they would alert the pilot to situations that are changing. 
The idea then is that they could then cue other sensors, sensors that have a higher degree of resolution and accuracy with which to respond to the threat if that's what they need to do. So no one sensor by itself can do it all. Some sensors are very good targeting sensors, but don't provide that 360 degree field of view, that general situational awareness. And it's really bringing the sensors together and combining their operation that's really key. One of the challenges we have is individual weapon systems, they are designed in parallel. They don't always share the same design solutions. As we try to connect them, either through communication systems, for example, we have to figure out ways to make them adaptable to each other. We have to make sure that they can speak the same language, that they share the same uh, standards and, and interfaces. Otherwise, there's really no way for them to operate jointly. And what we've been able to do is actually turn to the, uh, the commercial industry, which have matured a very large number of standards, many of which are actually used on the modern internet today. And we've been able to realize that these standards are actually the building blocks for us to use in our combat systems as well. In the past, rules of engagement were typically based on visual. I had to make visual, I had to actually see it was an enemy aircraft. I actually had to see that it was, he was wearing an enemy uniform before I could engage. Nowadays, with the amount of sensors we have, the capability of the sensors, the communication links that link all of these sensors and all this information together allows us to make high confidence evaluations of the ID of the particular target that we're looking at. And we can decide, we can use that information to make a decision. We don't need to have eyes on. I can see what each member of the flight is doing. I can see who's targeting what. And I can send them assignments. I can pick a target or a track from my display and send it to a wingman and say, you know, he knows that if I send you a track today, you are to engage that track. In order to accomplish what we want to accomplish, it takes a lot of team effort at our level. There's, there's people doing fusion, there's people doing communications, there's people doing mission. It all has to come together. A lot of it's driven by the pilot. The pilot will say what he wants in that, when he's in that cockpit. He wants to be able to do this, this, and this. We listen to that and we try to bring that to a reality. You know, the contract spec may say we want to do this. Pilot sits down in that seat and he says, well, I got to have it this way. And that drives exact solutions that we need to implement. And we communicate with them. We talk to them and say, what is it that you want to do? We will get you there. In the 30 plus years since Ace of Alley and Bavale, we've come a long way in advancing situational awareness, mission effectiveness, and survivability. Naval aviators fly as a highly networked team, while our engineers plan and design the next generation of fighters, plus manned and unmanned strike, reconnaissance, and surveillance systems. Thanks for visiting us for a look at the past, present, and future from the perspective of Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems. knowing that anybody else that was out there coming at us was, was bad. That was, that was a lot of fun.